Uh, if you look at the rhymes and the coded messages that were sent out... They sent out coded messages? They did send out coded messages, that's right. Well, I, I have one here. Can I read yeah, it yeah, to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And, um, th th this, this is a good example uh, of one of the surviving messages. These, these, by the way, were found in the pockets of rebels. Um, but here's one, I'll read it briefly. John Shep, sometime St Mary Priest of York, and now in Colchester, Greeteth well John Nameless, and John Miller, and John Carter, and biddeth Piers Plowman to go to his work and chastise well Hob the Robber. I didn't understand a word of that. What's it mean? Well, they're cryptically written, and we have to interpret from the Middle English. Now, if I can just translate quickly. Yes, please do. <laughs> um, John Shep, John the Shepherd, that, that's a New Testament reference. Sometimes St. Some, some Mary, priest of York. That refers to John Ball, who was an important leader of the rebellion, who, who was excommunicated, hence sometime. Greeteth well, John Nameless, every man, ordinary folk, and John Miller and John Carter, these are tradespeople, working people, and biddeth Pierce Plowman to go to his work and chastise well Hob the Robber. Hob the Robber was the nickname of Robert Tales. He was the treasurer uh, for the government. He was a hated, a hated figure. We have to understand here that uh, one of the causes of the rebellion was a hatred of taxation. Mm. This was a, an anti-poll tax rebellion on a grand scale. And this is a very specific instruction, chastise him well. This is a deadly instruction. They know what they're saying. The meaning's very clear. Messages imply that you can read, that you know what's going on on a national scale, that there's some kind of network that you can take the messages to. How come people were so well briefed and so organised? I think in every village there would have been somebody who could read, who would have been educated at the, at the local abbey. They would have relied on um, somebody standing on a little tussock or up on a barrel, reading out the coded messages, um, interpreting them for the audience. Uh, but, you know, I think you have to understand uh, communication in terms of the technology and the, uh, the, the society of the day. In, in the same way as today, uh, anti-globalisation protesters rely on, on the internet uh, or on email. Uh, in, the, in the 60s, people listened to their tranny radios for the latest news of the latest demonstration. Well, back in 1381, that's how people did it. So the, I think although the, the technology changes, uh, the sense of excitement and exhilaration at the latest piece of information or the latest story from London is kind of the same. It's the same um, feeling of being in a movement, the same feeling of liberation, the same feeling of excitement and not quite knowing what's going to happen next, but knowing that you want to be involved. These messages were shooting out from Essex in all directions to signal the start of the revolt. This explains why the south of England seems to spontaneously combust in the summer of 1381. And that brings us back to our own medieval traveller. Mike Lodes is on the first stage of a journey that will take him through Kent and eventually to London. But first, like Abel Kerr, he has to get across the Thames. He's asked me to meet him at Tilbury Docks, which doesn't sound very medieval. Mike, I know this place. My granddad used to work down here when I was a kid. He was a steward on a boat exactly like that for the Union Castle Line. So surely that's your answer. We get the horses on there and take them across. Well, far from being the answer, it's ships like that that are our problem. In what way? During the last few centuries, the Thames has been dredged into a deep channel, and that has made it much wider, and a much stronger current. It's more tidal because of boats like that. In the 14th century, it would have been a narrower, gentler, much easier crossing. OK, so the Abbey's burning on the other bank. Abel Kerr's come over here to get some men from Essex to go back to Kent. How does he get across? How does he get the horses across? Well, I've been looking into it. And my first thought, well, the answer is going to be a Thames wherry because that's a, a traditional Thames cargo craft. And what we found out was that they're not deep enough and we'd have to tack a lot to get across there and the boom wouldn't clear the horses' heads. So that was out. And I thought maybe some kind of barge. But then we've got issues of loading them and getting them down and the jetties aren't in place. So would there have been much traffic along here during the 14th century or would it have been pretty, stop that, pretty uh, <laughs> empty like it is now? I'm sure it would have been colossal because don't forget at this time the only bridge across the Thames was London Bridge, and that's miles upriver. So I'm sure they were plying to and fro all the time with cattle and sheep and produce. OK, so if we haven't got a roll-on, roll-off ferry, what are we going to do? Well, it is so tidal, it is so choppy, it would be too dangerous for the horses. 
So I've decided to try my luck and take them on the Tilbury passenger ferry. I'm not sure this one's too happy about it. No, I know, but I'm taking two along with me because I've got a long ride now. We're going down to Canterbury and riding back and we need a relay of horses. So I'm going to try and get these two onto the ferry. Six days into the revolt, Abel Kerr headed back to Kent with 100 men from Essex. He landed in Dartford. Two days later, Abel, boosted with reinforcements, launched the first rebel strike on a major military target. All right, Tony, here we are. Ready to go. They moved from Dartford onto Rochester. A week after the start of the revolt, the peasants had the confidence to attack one of the best defended fortresses in the land. Rochester Castle had a fearsome reputation. The peasants risked everything just to free a serf from the dungeons. There was a chap called Robert Belling who'd been living in Gravesend for some time and one of the King's knights turned up and said, Oi, I recognise you. You're one of my runaway serfs. You're my property. I want you back. And Belling said, I'm not. And a big dispute broke out. And while they were waiting to decide who was right, Belling was banged up here in Rochester Castle. The local people were absolutely furious. It became a cause celeb. On the 6th, the rioters from Dartford turned up here and surrounded the castle. Now, look at this place. It's purpose-built to withstand a siege. When King John arrived here in the year 1215, it took siege engines and tunnels before the castle surrendered. But the Dartford men arrived and the doors opened. There must have been a heck of a lot of support for them, both outside the castle and inside. At the heart of each of these momentous events were individual men and women. And amazingly, 600 years later, we know who some of them were. The Peasants' Revolt wasn't just about the workers. There were all sorts. Ordinary blokes like soldier Thomas Wooden, He'd been paid 30 pounds up front to sail for France with the army, but he jumped ship at Dartford and joined the rebels storming Rochester Castle. You'd never call Sir Thomas Raven a peasant. Even though he was an MP and the bailiff of Rochester Castle, he was an enthusiastic supporter of the revolt. But the man who emerged as overall leader was a tradesman. We know that because his name has echoed down the centuries. I don't remember much from my school, but one name that sticks in my head, probably sticks in yours too, is Watt Tyler. When the revolt started, there were lots of local leaders, but when they got here to Maidstone, they elected one national leader, Watt, which was short for Walter, and he really was a Tyler, probably worked on the roofs of abbeys and churches, that kind of thing. Other than that, we know virtually nothing about him. Some say he was a local radical, others that he was from Dartford or even Essex. But it was here that he came to the fore in Maidstone where he was elected leader and where he helped to rescue another of the leading lights of the revolt, John Ball, who was being held as a prisoner in the Archbishop's Palace, which is now a registry office. Watt Tyler and his men wrecked the palace and broke open the jail, freeing John Ball and the other prisoners. Why on earth would an archbishop have a prison? Oh, I suppose it all turns really on, on our understanding what an archbishop is in the late 14th century and thinking that an archbishop is a really a powerful prince. The chief vicar. Uh, yes, yeah, I, and, and, and the, none greater than the Archbishop of Canterbury. And having two major domains which he's going to uh, use a prison for people who uh, fall foul of his ecclesiastical courts, and he's going to use it for...